all these short-term bridge loans, um, sometimes two, three bridge loans that might have been piled up and maybe what potential problems could be? Yeah, definitely. So, like, imagine, um, well, let's put it in practical terms. Like, imagine you, uh, you, Mark, you bought a house and, you know, you bought it in the second quarter of 21 and you bought it with, like, a two-year loan, right? And your plan was to rent it out and you, at that point, or like anybody else that could kind of see, like, rents flying off the page, thought that, like, at a, a you know, a three a sub three percent interest rate that by the way these are floating loans right so they're not fixed in at rate they they float with the market you're locking you thought you were getting a three percent cost of financing and that like over the next three years rents were going to grow fifteen percent per year and the bet you were making was that like you could pay a really high price or a low cap rate earn um, that growth on your rents and then on the back end of it refinance it at a much higher higher value right so that was the bet that a lot of these guys were making well it's and been what the they game were doing, that's been working were, for a long time it's been working for a really long time but in this case because the the, the debt markets were so open a lot of these guys used like 90 percent plus um you know or like think think of the inverse they only put like five to ten percent equity in so the ltv on a lot of these loans is 80% or higher. Now, what happened between now and then, right? Like inflation obviously soared, Fed came in, jacked up rates faster than like any of us have ever seen, at least in our lifetimes, right? Um, rent growth slowed. So like if you thought you were, you, th you thought you were getting 15% NOI growth per year or like rent growth per year, maybe that turned into 8% compounded. And at the same time, your, your cost of borrowing went from two to seven. So when you go into the permanent financing market, suddenly the math doesn't work anymore. And you can only, you know, finance maybe 60 to 65 percent of the value. And oh, by the way, the value came down 35 <laughs> percent. Yep. So like a lot of these guys and I know you under I know you, you get it. But like practically speaking, like what a lot what this really means for folks is that everyone's underwater. And so a lot of these guys are running around trying to like basically get another two to three year bridge loan to get them to the other side, making the bet that the Fed's going to have to cut rates and they'll be able to live, like basically live to fight another day. And, you know, we at Hedgeye, like we're we're kind of um, we're very rate of change focused, but like we also think that we're going to be uh, higher for longer um, pretty clearly and that the Fed, every time the market rips the way it has, the Fed is more incented to like keep rates higher for longer so that it makes that like ability to kick the can a lot tougher for these guys and I and I'm seeing it and we're seeing it like with one of the REITs that I cover called Arbor um, ABR it's a mortgage REIT they, they only do these like two and three year bridge loans for uh, for apartment sponsors basically they're already seeing you know guys literally just give the keys back and like maybe flee the country because they're just like they put five percent equity in and they're underwater and it's like you know what we lost this one we're out and then yeah. the lenders stuck with the keys Hmm. So it's, it's messy. And then like those impairments, what's going to happen is those losses are going to start showing up, I think, over the next like quarter or two on on not just the banks, but like these, you know, um, shadow lenders balance sheets and their earnings are going to be bad. Um, they're probably going to have to raise equity in some some cases to like, you know, basically have a capital buffer and still be able to lend out. Right. It's, it's, it's a really tough situation, I think. And the and the other the other big thing on that is not only obviously the problems that you've already uh, talked about. So you have uh, multiple kind of attacks, if you if you will. So one, you have uh, you know potentially people not buying. Two, you have this loan that has to be rolled over that now you can't afford at the new rate. But then on top of it, you have because this problem has been created by the Fed raising rates so much, people that were buying buildings at a three, four, five percent cap rate don't want to buy it at a three, four, five percent cap rate anymore when I can go make five percent just sitting at the Fed. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so now they've drained the, away liquidity from the market. Yeah. And, and by the way, like it's, it's actually a lot scarier than that. So some of these deals that I've been looking at were done at like two and a half percent cap rates um, in the first and second quarter of 21. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of risk. And, and they levered themselves up 80 percent. It just the math doesn't work. And you're right. Right. Like what there's you, you and I may like hate monetary policy the way <laughs> the way it's run yeah. and i think you and i we pro i'm guessing we probably see eye to eye on that but like the reality is you know you basically have on a nominal basis you have a risk-free risk-free bet at five percent right now so right why why take the other side of that yeah yeah it makes no sense and that that that, that creates even more problems so there's two potential things here that i want to talk about and see if we can uh 
speculate on to potentially what could happen from this. And so one is like obviously all this debt that could potentially go bad. People just hand the keys over, they're walking away, and that just kind of rolls up to whatever bank's holding that paper or whatever mm-hmm. REIT or wh- wherever that is. So there's, there's a big problem there. Now, it seems like <laughs> what I would expect after seeing what happened with these um, new, new uh, facilities the Fed put in, you know, with um, the BTFP, et cetera, is probably something going back to like what we saw in 2008, where maybe the Fed just says, give me all your mortgage-backed securities. I'll just put you, give you back to par. So maybe all these commercial mortgage-backed securities that are sitting there, whatever, $2.9 trillion, they need to be rolled over, and there's this big debt bomb that's sitting there that a lot of people are warning about. Potentially, the Fed could just be like, okay, like we see the problem there. We don't want the system to collapse. We'll just put them on our books. We'll give you back at par. It's possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... Um, I mean, well, if not, the, we end up in a 2008 meltdown scenario, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think... Um, so I'm, I'm just guessing here, but we're I think all guessing it has here. To, just for everyone listening, we're all we're guessing. All guessing. <laughs> we're all guessing. It, it has to get a lot worse from here. So if if you recall last time around, um, and I'm just thinking about this through the lens of, of commercial real estate, not resi. You know what was happening was you were kind of like um, some of the like I, I, let's talk about lodging. Like so, the hotel sector got very over levered going into the 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 GFC from a commercial, like on the commercial real estate side. And what happened was um, a couple of uh, borrowers or sponsors started running into trouble and they started kicking back assets like onesies and twosies back to the banks and the banks were taking the keys. But then what happened was things got real and everybody was defaulting together and suddenly the bank said, hey, time out. Like, we actually can't, we don't want to, but we actually cannot take all of this back at once because we'll have to raise too much equity. And that's when the market, like, you know, and you and I saw it, like the days where all the banks were dropping 20, 30% per day, started pricing in the banks having, if, if they were able to survive at all, having to do these big giant equity raises, right? Because they would have to raise equity to hold against the assets that they take, they take back in lieu of like a loan. Because again, banks aren't in the business of owning real estate, they're in the business of making loans. Right. And so my thought is like, before we get there, like it's gotta get a lot worse and they're either gonna, the Fed's either gonna do what you said or they're gonna do like some form of capital injections into the banks if it got that bad, similar to last time, to give the banks basically cushion to absorb those losses. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a logical conclusion, right? Like I don't, I don't know, I don't think the private markets would, would be too keen on recapping the banks given that there's a backstop, right? So yeah. Well, I guess, uh, and and just kind of in that thought exercise, kind of going back to some of these uh, some of these uh, takes where you know Elon Musk says commercial real estate is by far the most serious looming issue, right? And like I said, mm-hmm. you look at uh, look, it looks like a lot of the smaller tier banks are the ones sitting on this paper, and they're the ones that are most vulnerable. And so, like, while it looks like it could bring the whole house of cards down. Um, it seems like the Fed would probably step in and bail out the House of Cards before it all came down. To your point that you're making, though, I think it has to get a lot worse. So-